technical challenges, uh, some of the internal technical challenges in uh, building uh, Ruby uh, using small bots. So as I'm sure you've heard by now, we have this project uh, called Maglev, which is to build a, a completely new implementation of Ruby that we think has some advantages over some of the other ones. But, but one of the first questions that some of you might have uh, about this project is, why <laughs> would they build a Ruby product when we have a perfectly good small box product? And that's an understandable question. And there's a, there's a, you know, there's a very simple answer to this. <laughs> okay, well, it is true that we do hope to make some money off of this, otherwise we wouldn't be doing it. But really, there's more to it than just that. We think that we bring a lot of value uh, to the Ruby community, and the Ruby community is a very interesting community. Uh, it's very large, it's very vibrant, and and the people there have uh, you know have respect for small talk. So uh, the Ruby people tend to think that Java is a dirty word, but small talk. Even if they don't know anything about small talk, they go, "Oh, it's small talk. Small talk's the, the the elder language, the elder language from which Ruby sprang." And, and be respected for that, even if they don't. And some of them, when they actually learn about small talk, sort of semi-convert and, and start doing more small talk in Ruby. Uh, is there anybody here today that, that started out in Ruby but is now doing small talk? There we go. Julia, very good example. So, <laughs> It's small talk all the way down, it's just objects, you can save them, 
You don't have to deal with object conditional mapping. You can make the object model what it wants to be for the problem. You don't have to make it look like tables and rows. All that's gone. Small bug all the way down. This is what we like to refer to as transparent persistence. Which uh, this particular screen here is um, is was a splash screen for one of the early um, glass releases, pre-releases, and uh, an example of playing on the transparentness of glass and the transparent persistence. So we want to be able to bring that kind of transparent persistence to Ruby, and also have a fairly fast Ruby virtual machine. Ruby is not known for its speed. Yes. Can you turn on the microphone? There's mic. Do you want it louder? It's not on. Yes, it's on. It's on. Oh, it's on. Oh, it's on. Here, I will show you. I will turn it off. Okay, now it is on. <laughs> So we want to be able to bring transparent persistence uh, to Ruby. And now I'm getting echoes. Okay. Uh, but if that's better for you, okay. So in order to bring transparent uh, persistence to Ruby, the first thing we had to do was we had to make one really big choice. We had a couple of, of options for a basic approach to making a Ruby implementation. We could either take our existing Smallbug product <coughs> and our Smallbug virtual machine and our Smallbug class library and incrementally enhance it until now it runs Ruby. Or we could take an existing uh, Ruby implementation, an open source Ruby implementation, such as the one we were particularly looking at was the Rubinius project, which was uh, working on creating a a Ruby implementation, largely written in Ruby, the way Smallbook is written in Smalltalk, and using a virtual machine based on uh, bytecode interpretation, a lot of the Smalltalk blue book, uh, which was very different than the approach that had been taken to previous Ruby implementations. And we looked at taking their implementation of Ruby and inserting our transactional persistence underneath that. And that inserting our transactional persistence underneath an existing virtual machine for another language was the approach that we had taken for our Java product um, a decade ago. And that worked pretty well. So we had experience with that. We knew that that could work. We knew kind of how it would work. Um, the expanding of our, of our small product had some potential advantages, but it wasn't something that we had done before. So that carried some risk. So as it turns out that we we chose to expand our small talk product uh, after a lot of discussion. We chose to expand the small talk product and build the Ruby on top of the small talk. Which I think is really fortunate because otherwise I wouldn't have an appropriate talk for these items. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about five, um, if I have time, five particular challenges technically that we had in the early days of this project, which started about 18 months ago. And there have been many other minor challenges since then, and some major challenges, but we don't have time to talk about them all. Uh, so, challenge one, the compiler. I've been asked about this by several people here already this week. How do you, how do you parse Ruby? Syntax is terrible. Okay. <laughs> well, let's take a look at just how terrible it is. Okay. This is the ENF for uh, Gemstone Smalltalk. Um, a few of you sitting right down front may be able to read that. But at any rate, that's the whole thing. You can get an idea of the general level of complexity. So let's compare that to the Ruby grammar. <laughs> <laughs> Which was the current release 
at the time we started this project, has a file in it, a handwritten, it uses bison to parse, which is a, a yak variant, and, uh, which is in C. And it uses a handwritten .y file to specify the grammar and, and what you do with it. Okay, there's parse.y. <laughs> It's 134 pages formatted the same font and settings as I formatted the, the small talk VNF, which was two pages. So for comparison, there's where the small talk VNF would fit in the Ruby parse.y. Now there is some stuff that isn't just strict VNF in the parse.y. The parse.y is, however, a fairly big fraction of it. So that gives you an idea of how complicated the Ruby syntax is uh, compared to the small talk syntax. So, so what did we do? Well, we looked at what other implementations like Rubinius were doing, what people tended to be doing in the alternative Ruby implementations that were just getting started at that time, was they took this font and they hand edited it to match the needs of their implementation. Well, we were trying to get something basically running so we could demo it at a conference 100 days after we started the project. Doing that really didn't, and we're small one people, you know, doing this didn't sound like fun, and it sounded like it would take a lot of time. So what do we do? <laughs> you cheat. <laughs> okay, there's just no other way. So, okay, so how do we cheat? So here's what we ended up doing. So we started with this, uh, with a small talk compiler, this section of the diagram. So we had a Smalltalk compiler front end that took Smalltalk uh, source code and produced an uh, intermediate uh, representation, uh, and then a, a compiler back end that turned that intermediate representation into sort of bytecodes, Smalltalk bytecodes. And both of these components were written in C, um, which allows our product to bootstrap itself. Um, we built, unlike unlike some implementations that haven't built a new image from scratch ever, we build new images many times a week because. We build from scratch every time we build. Uh, and uh, so what we end up doing is we read in Ruby from a source code file, and we uh, and then we poke that source code file out over a socket to a parse server, which is MRI Ruby 186, which has a parser built into it. And we run a little program there that's written. Uh, a little program that we wrote that, that also uses a, a, a component that was uh, written by Ryan Davis, who's uh, well known in the Ruby community and is a former small talker, that reaches down into the C memory, pulls the abstract <coughs> syntax tree out of the C memory once it's been parsed, and makes textual S expressions out of it. So we take those S expressions and then ship them back over the socket, put them into a very simple parser that's written in small talk. It doesn't take much of a parser to turn S expressions into an abstract syntax tree. It all does itself. So we get an abstract syntax tree, and then we run this uh, Ruby front end compiler. Now, this is fairly complicated. As you can imagine, with all that syntax specification, you get a lot of different node types in your uh, abstract syntax tree, and the relation between them, there's a lot of different combinatorics of what kind of structures you have to make to fulfill the Ruby language semantics. So what we spent most of our first 100 days, and we did come up with a demo in our first 100 days, and it did work, we spent most of our time working on this piece right here, the Ruby front end compiler, which is written in small talk. So we have the advantage of being able to work in small talk there. Now, we used this basic structure for over a year. And uh, recently, we moved beyond this phase. We no longer have to cheat quite as badly. What we now have is this. We have a Ruby parser written in Ruby. <coughs> this is also um, written by Ryan Davis, although we spent about a month uh, optimizing it and, and customizing it for our needs. But it, is, it uses Rack, which is a Ruby, uh, written in Ruby Yak version, and has a .y file that we didn't have to write, <coughs> and um, produces an abstract syntax tree in, in Ruby objects. Now, since the parser is written in Ruby, you can't bootstrap yourself up. So we still use we still use the old way 
to bootstrap. But once you bootstrap and you've got your, your Ruby uh, compiler, um, your Ruby parser are in the uh, in vineyard persistent memory event. You're all good to go. You're no longer in the MRI process. Basically, what it allows you to do is you can you can pass a, uh, a block along with, and the semantics of the block are, are very similar to small talk. But you can you can pass a block along with every message sent, and and the the method may choose to do something with that block or not. And there's a couple of things it can do with it. It can either if it does something with it, it can either have a yield statement somewhere in the message in the method. And that basically turns control over to the block. So it's evaluate the block that I was passed now. Um, or if you want to, you can actually define a, a parameter with the ampersand uh, as the last parameter in the method signature. And if a block is passed, then that, that parameter will now refer to the proc instance that represents that block. In, in Ruby, proc is the, is the class of, of blocks, and the term block is only used for the actual syntactic construct, which is confusing for small blockers. Does that help me? Okay. Um, what about the asterisk? You say you pass an array and it's treated with there's, Yeah, there's. So you pass a list of arguments and I, I do have examples of that a little later. Okay. So ask me again if, I, if that isn't clear after we go through that. So the small block virtual machine expects the sender and receiver area to always match. You, you, you send, and the structure of the keyword arc, uh, keyword selectors ensures that this has to be the case. You know, a given selector can only take a certain number of arguments. And therefore, uh, when you build a small block virtual machine, you normally don't put on the, on the stack contexts, in the stack context format, you don't put how many arguments you're passing because it's inherent. So, you know, at this particular sentence, I can always send two arguments, and that always aligns to some method that expects two arguments, and you never have to match them up. So, uh, so we have a problem there because, of course, our virtual machine doesn't pass along how many arguments we get. And we looked at the possibility of changing our stack frame format to add a word that says, here's how many arguments we're passing, and then you can the, the send byte codes and the, and the method follow-ups just uh, accordingly and maybe the Ruby semantics. But that would also penalize our small book execution because it would have to, to have these numbers of things pushed up the stack and slow that down a little bit. So, and we decided uh, to cheat. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> to cheat. Okay. It's about to be cheating. <laughs> The, uh, so what we do, we, we, we have the compiler synthesize what we call bridge methods. So when you define a method like this one, um, you find a method, this defines a method with the selector of foo and it takes uh, two 
declared uh, parameters here, a fixed uh, parameter and a star parameter, which says that basically, you know, if I were to pass uh, five arguments to this method, I would get the first one would be put into the parameter A, and the last four would be rolled up into a four element array, which would give it to me as B. This compiles these 16 methods. The one in blue, foo colon star as a selector, is the, is the real one that contains the actual code that's here in these ellipses between the death and the end. And the other ones are all bridge methods, which just adjust the, the parameters. Uh, you know, they, they, they went beside the arguments appropriately and then pass it on. So we've got every combination here of from zero to three fixed arguments, and with and without the star, and with and without the ampersand. And uh, so we actually compile things using these selectors. Now these selectors are not legal for small talk, but only the small talk compiler cares about that. The virtual machine doesn't care what characters are actually in a selector. It never looks at that. So as long as our compiler can make these, we know they won't collide with anything, and, and uh, because they're not otherwise legal, and they work. Do you always create these methods, or do you, use it, do you create them lazily? No, they are always all created. We did consider lazy creation. It's certainly possible by using uh, does not understand. Oh, well, maybe because if, if you are not sending a message with the I don't know, with, uh, with the array, I mean, if, if you compile the code where it's sending the message to the array, and then you don't have the method, then you can create it. That, that, that's right. what I meant is right. lazy. Right. Lazy, I compile them. Yeah, you, you can't actually detect oh, you because you don't know. Oh, okay. You don't know. You don't know who might send this message, and because oh, okay. it's all dynamic late bound, mm -hmm. you, when you compile the send site, you don't know which classes the receivers yeah, might be. Right. Okay. So you would have to do it at runtime through through uh, does not understand, which could be done. Okay. Uh, also, there is the possibility of that you could have messages <coughs> with more than three fixed arguments, mm -hmm. and there's very few of those. We chose zero to three based on the fact that it covers the vast majority of cases. And any additional ones, you can all roll up into three fixed arguments and a star, which is what we do. Yes? Um, so <coughs> these messages, are they visible in the image? So are, they, are you really compiling source code for those? Or are they just virtual somewhere in between? Um, they're real methods. They exist in the method dictionary. Um, because Ruby doesn't really have many tools for examining method dictionary, no one really notices. <laughs> so yeah, at, this, at this point, we are, we are doing, uh, we are supporting tools in this file that Ruby programmers are used to them, which is editing source code files in a text editor and running things. It's really very crude compared to what um, small talk developers are used to. And I think that that's something that we will uh, want to do at some point, is to provide some browser-like, you know, some better tools. And those tools will probably um, you know, hide at least partially the, the existence of the bridge methods. Uh, but you know, at this point, those tools don't exist, so it's, it's really not an issue. So, so what do we propose to do with like? Okay, we have an example of that on the next slide. That's very good. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> so here's an example of, uh, of color now. Um, so if we say uh, we have some object and we send it the foo message, and we give it the arguments uh, A and B, and we say star C, which says C is an array, and, I, and I'm not treating it as a single argument, I'm treating it as a collection of arguments. Okay. So that compiles a send to the selection <coughs> colon colon star with those three arguments. And now the bridge method, foo colon colon star on that class, then adapts the number of arguments and resends it. Uh, to the real one. If we go back here and look at what the real one, the real one is foo colon star. So what that's going to do is he's going to take, so it's going to take, it's going to take A and send it in as the first argument. And then it's going to take B and the array C and it's going to make a new array with B as the first element and everything that was in C is the remainder of that array. It's going to pass that as the second argument. Yes, that's Ruby. Really okay. <laughs> yes? What is the star in the foo? Because I was thinking the star was the definition. Star can be on both uh, the send site and the, and the definition. And what does it mean in the, the send? It 
means this is it means that this is a collection of arguments. So if so if C is an array with four elements, saying A B star C in the send site is the same as sending six individual arguments. Semantically, it's exactly the same. It's the same thing with five plus. Right. Yeah. Sandboxing, which is one of the applications of it. 
Basically, what it allows you to do is you can have a method dictionary per class, per environment. An environment is just some thing with an identifier. There can be some relatively small number of them, certainly less than 64K, some limited number, but not a tiny, tiny number, although we're only using um, like three or four environments right now. So you can have a method dictionary per class, per environment, although if you want the same behavior in a class in multiple environments, you can, the multiple environments can share the same method dictionary for that class. Um, and if some of the methods are the same, which is often the case, between different method dictionaries in which there are some differences, then that particular method, compiled method, can be shared uh, between the different method dictionaries. But each send site, everywhere there's a send byte code in a compiled method, every send site specifies the selector and the environment that that send is going to. So by default, when you compile a Ruby method, it says, I am sending in the Ruby environment for every send in that method. And when you compile a small block method, it says, I am sending in the small block environment. And this separates the behaviors uh, between the two. Uh, this complicates the, the full method lookup when you have to do the complete traversal. Complicates that a bit because you have to pay attention to which environment it is and figure out which set of method dictionaries you're using and all of that. However, once you cache the result of that lookup, the caching is pretty much the same because every send site has a, uh, uh, every send site is, is specific to one environment and that's fixed. Then that result that you get back is okay, it's going to be good until normal invalidation if you change code somewhere, for instance. Yes, sir. Did you check what, did you check what the Beximos did to support uh, selecting in the space? Because what he did at that time was he introduced um, some rules and he overwrite, I guess that he, he overwrote the equality or he had something like equal, equal, equal for some rule. So this means that two symbols could be equal, or they would be only uh, equal if they would be to the same namespace, so like that, it does not have. This means that, and then when it compiles, it compiles the selector with the tag of the element, so like that, like that in the dictionary, in the compiler will only look for the right symbol. Yes. And then you don't have to look for all the problems in this environment, because you are in the environment, because your symbol is defined in the environment. Right. Uh, we do encode the symbol, we do encode the environment into the symbol, but then we do have, we do start the lookup with a split in the environment ID that, uh, that looks at particular method dictionaries. So, um, I, I found this trick really neat because, yeah. because we are always thinking, okay, how can we do something without having this extra cost? And just because you have to do that, oh, yeah, now we have a polymorphic symbol, and yeah, yeah. We our symbols are. Uh, we do have a way of encoding the environment ID into the symbol when it's when it's compiled into a method. So there aren't any actual words. You just have a selector that encodes the actual selector and the symbol. But the, the symbol identity will be the same no matter what select, no matter what environment it's in. Okay. And we need to hurry a little bit up so I can reach the end before my time. Um, fortunately, this challenge is not that much of a challenge. In Ruby, you can add methods to individual objects. And you can also do uh, a sort of multiple inheritance scheme by mixing in modules at, at the class level, which effectively adds um, chunks of behavior. Um, not really quite like traits, but not that far off either. You can basically take a chunk of, of behavior and insert it in the lookup chain. And in fact, that's the way we implement it. So that's the way we implement it. Is that on an instance, if you add a method to an instance, then you basically create a, a, a virtual class that's normally invisible in its, in its superclass chain between it and its class um, that contains that extra behavior. And on the class side, if you import a module into a class, then you create, uh, have a, a copy of that module object, which is basically like a class in Ruby, the module is a super class of the class. And you, you make a copy of that module object and you insert it in between that class and its super class in the lookup chain. And, and that's the way you do it. And so that's the way we did it. Didn't have to choose. It was easy anyway. But it was a little weird for small talkers to do that. Challenge five, the last one we're going to look at today, is per instance variables. Okay. This one I wrote out because it's so weird <laughs> to a small talk person. In Ruby, an instance variable is created by the act of assigning to it. In 
small talk, when you create an object with new, that that object has at creation time all the instance variables it's ever going to have, and they are initialized to nil. In Ruby, when you create an object that has no instance variables, period, ever. Yes? It, I thought it, when you could follow the method, if the method refers to a variable, you would do the, the check check then. No. Now you can ask a Ruby object whether it has a, a, an instance variable or a particular name. Even if there's an assignment in the next line to that instance variable name, if you ask it above that, it has to answer false. That's one of the requirements. So, do you have instance variable foo? No! Then foo colon equal, you know, foo at foo equals something, and then now it exists. So, that semantics is a little bit interesting to, uh, to, to actually make. So, um, so the way that Ruby does this is kind of slow, and basically every object is uh, sort of a dictionary. You know, it has a main value of pairs, and then the dictionary is empty when you start, and then you just add main value of pairs to it as you assign to it. And we do that because we have to uh, also, but it's kind of nice having uh, fixed offsets for instance variables as well. So when we can, we create fixed offsets for instance variables, and we initialize them to a special <coughs> I'm not here value, so that you ask if it's there, it will return false. And I believe that that is essentially a, another, uh, essentially another instance of undefined object uh, that is not nil that we use for that purpose. Uh, and we have a, a special uh, primitive creating new Ruby object that initializes all of the fixed the existing slots to that value instead of initializing them to nil. So, um, but we can't do that always. So, what you end up with is objects with some number of fixed named instance variables, and then there may be some name value pairs coming after that that have to be linearly searched when you're looking for, for a particular uh, instance variable. And the reason for that is that, is that finding out what all the possible instance variables is, is difficult. Now here's the way you define a class in Ruby. So you, you have a, a class definition, and you have a method definition, and there's an assignment. Um, at sign means I'm talking about an instance variable. And you assign it to some value, and that, when it executes, creates the instance variable. But at compile time, we can tell, hey, there's an assignment to this name, so we actually assign that a fixed offset. And, and use that. But now you've got the, the end of your class definition, and then sometime later, you actually parse some code that says class my example again. Well, this does not create a new class. This reopens, re enters the, the environment of that class, and you can define more things on it. So you can define more assignments to instance variables you didn't know before. So we don't catch those. And maybe that code isn't even in the system anywhere. Maybe it's bought it in a socket or something. There's no way to know. So when you execute that kind of code, then you're going to add a dynamic instance variable. Okay. Even if you catch them, the order in which you have a variable is the index of the variable. Yes, but the index of the variable doesn't matter that much. As long as, it, as, long as everybody knows it, it's, you know, it's like, it's like in small time, unless you're doing this for that or for that, but you can swap all the names as far as around and nobody cares. Yes. Have you seen the VA implementation of JavaScript with Google and Microsoft? Because in JavaScript it's very similar, you can't be right. and it's not it's not possible to use the same I haven't looked at what they about what they did. Because what they did what they do is they change the pointer to the class. I mean if there is a new instance variable, they create like a new class, a subclass. Right. class. You know, hidden subclass and unused class, and, and so now it, 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 they're not using dictionaries anymore. Yeah, we're yeah, we're different. trying to do a, a a hybrid between that because if, if you're doing it a lot, it's expensive to keep yeah. modifying your, your your individual classes, and there's extra objects, and the cost of that gets very high. So this one, we try to catch as many as we can up front and make them static, okay. and then do this afterwards. We've talked about having some maintenance operations on persistent objects that are long lived to go through and actually, you know, as a, as a maintenance sweep to roll through and find all the dynamic instance variables and roll them up into the fixed instance variables. But that's not, we're not doing that. <coughs> okay, uh, I am basically out of time, so let's uh, rush through the rest of it. Okay, over time, we've gotten to pass a lot more tests. Um, you can't read this probably, but back here.
here in October of 08, we were passing about 3,600 of the core, uh, this is the Ruby compliance test. Um, as of like a couple of weeks ago, we were passing 18,600. So you can see that we had a lot more challenges other than the ones I've talked about to deal with over the last year. Uh, there's, there's how many quarter thousand? 24,000. So we're passing almost 19,000 out of 24,000. So we're getting there. We can't maintain this rate of increase for very long because we're going to run out of tests. <laughs> okay. So did we make the right choice in choosing in choosing small block? Okay, everyone knows the answer to that. Yes, we did. Okay. And and why did we, you know, why was small block so great? It's because small block lets us. Okay. <laughs> it's not really cheating. It's just, it's just using a tool that lets you do uh, really cool stuff. Um, and that's not cheating, that's, that's smart. Okay. Um, so, uh, if I have a Some benchmarks are good, some benchmarks are bad. On the whole, 